and welcome Stacey to the stage. Thank you. I can make that joke because I'm Canadian. Um, I apologize, my voice is a little rough. Um, but we're going to wear through it, aren't we? And yes, I'm from Microsoft, but I'm not going to be talking about Microsoft. Yes. <laughs> so uh, just want to start off with what I want to walk through in this presentation a little bit about is some of the devices that are out there that you can start using day to day and give you some inspiration of ways that you can start playing with them and thinking about connected spaces because a lot of us do browser work and the reality is, is when you're in the browser and you make something in the browser, you have no idea how someone reacts to that experience. The only thing that you really have to tell you about that experience that they're having, if you're not physically there, is analytics, right? Um, and that's about it. You don't really have too much to tell you about that interaction. Um, I was lucky this year to discover or be able to work more in the IoT space, and I'm going to talk a, a lot about that and a little bit about the future. And then I'm going to segment into stuff that I've built over the past year. Um, it's not too, uh, <laughs> I'm not going to say it's a hardcore technical savvy. It's more on the useless humor side. But it can give you an idea of like, if you want to start, where can you start? Because it's actually very easy for just anyone to start. So when we think about IoT, someone had posted this uh, on Twitter, and I thought this was really, really funny. Um, you know, your cat just checked into a litter box, right? And or thinking about these things where nowadays everything is connected. Anything that can be is, and there's no question of if it should be. Right? And that's that always that mantra in design is just because you can, should you? Right? And you see this in, in connected devices. And so, you know, it's funny, I saw this, I posted it, and someone said to me, I actually need to know when my cat is in the litter box because, uh, you know, they're not doing so well, I need to report back to the vet the activity. And I was like, here's the parts that you need to make it. Go make it done, you know, go make it so. And so you're in this world now where it's completely capable um, or DIY yourself in order to basically connect anything. And so when we think of the term, how many people have heard the term Internet of Things? Like everyone can probably put up their hand, right? Like how many want to admit they've heard that term or that they've used it? It's more like, you know, the proper question, right? And so it's a vague term for a very specific reason. Most people, when they think about Internet of Things, they think of something that's uh, connected, giving them some kind of information, right? Uh, a Fitbit, something on your, you know, something on your, your wrist, uh, the nest in your home, that kind of thing. Um, and so, you know, we think about this connectivity and just the fact that the internet is, in fact, just a series of tubes. And you think about what lies in those series of tubes, which tends to be cats in that sense. There will be a lot of this, don't worry. Um, but when we think about the Internet of Things and trying to get a little bit more specific with it is very hard. And so one of my good friends, um, Sebley, he basically said, well, it's stuff and things talking to the interwebs, right? Equally vague. Um, but that's really what it is. It's anything that you think that you want information from connected to the Internet. It could be getting you notifications. You could be saving data, all that kind of stuff. And so I always kind of break it out into these three columns, even though there's a fourth one that I'm not really going to talk about too much. And so one is things, all the things. It could be your frying pan. It could be your shoes. It can be anything you can imagine connected somehow, right? Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, some other protocol, OK? And then data and analysis, right? And this is the one that a lot of us forget about, is that connected items are only as good um, in terms of what they can do for you based on the data that they're kind of spitting out, right? And so it's no, no use for you to be collecting your sleep patterns if you can't analyze them at some point in time, if they don't provide some kind of insight. So data and analysis is actually the big part when it comes to big companies and the Internet of Things. Internet of Things, a lot of people like to talk about it like I do at a grassroots level. 
more of a maker level, right? But when it comes to big business, Internet of Things, why is it such a big deal? Well, when you think about it, if they can analyze something and pinpoint little problems and maybe try to figure out ways to preemptively solve for those problems, they're gonna save tons and tons of money. Uh, imagine that you owned a whole bunch of vending machines, right? And you wanted to know which ones, you know, basically empty out sooner. Uh, is the cooling working okay? Which, you know, what are the patterns that I'm seeing in temperature and in usage and all those things before they break down? Can I go and service them ahead of time? Can I save myself money, you know? And so that's where big business really starts to play. When we think about devices, they've said that 50 million devices will be connected by 2020, right? 50 million, that's insane. I think if you go home, most of us would say you definitely have more than one device connected to the internet, right? I'm embarrassed to tell you how many I have. Like it's, it's not anything I will ever share, right? But think about it, think about all the things that you have connected and that you want to connect, right? Um, and so 50 million, that means that there's a potential for 200 devices per person. So maybe all your home automation stuff, maybe it's all your fitness tracking stuff, maybe it's your smart mirror, maybe it's your car that's in the garage, um, you know, all of these items being connected per person could potentially be the future, right? And so you start to wonder, is this what the future is going to be, right? Are we connecting these devices for any purpose? Are they going to take on uh, more of this kind of human aspect to them, for example? And you're seeing that across the board. And so when I like to think about, uh, yeah, I'll frame this. <laughs> it needs framing, right? Um, when I think about this area and I think about how can you get started, I often think about hardware. And hardware scares me. It doesn't anymore, but about two years ago, hardware kind of scared me. I don't have an electrical engineering uh, degree. I don't have any desire to go get one, right? Um, I am a self-trained developer. I am the type of developer that my company actually does not like very much, right? Because I'm not a proper comp sci developer. But when I think about hardware, I think about a whole new kind of door opening for me because the software part is so easy. So how many people in here do uh, something like JavaScript or C Sharp or Python or any of those kind of languages, right? How many people design for the web at all, for example? So you have aspect to that even if you're not a JavaScript developer. You work with someone who does that, for example. So you're part of that camp whether you know it or not. And so that whole idea that the skill set and that even the amount of people doing web dev can now take their web dev skills and all of a sudden play in a whole new playground is insane, right? And so I always thought, oh, hardware, I'm so scared of electricity. Like, I like my eyebrows. I don't want to burn them off, you know? Um, I'm scared of, like, that moment of when you plug something in and it's something going to happen that shouldn't. Um, I was the kid with the fork, you know, near near the plugins, and my parents were like, <laughs> no, don't. Um, and so, the, you know, when you're thinking about the stuff that we're talking about in terms of hardware, the amount of uh, electricity, the amount of risk is so minimal because you're dealing with things that are like 3.3 or 5 volts. Very, very, very small. It's not remotely like what you plug into the wall, 120 or whatnot. And so, you know, you're never going to do something quite as silly as this, right, one would hope. But when it comes to software, there's that equal risk and there's that idea of like just looking at this, and this is something that one of my hardware buddies sent to me, he's like, I'm scared of software because with one line of code, I could erase my whole hard disk, right? So similar risks, right? And yet, it's quite easy to just go in and get started. And so, I want to take you through some of the things that you could be playing with or considering in terms of devices. And I'm looking again at like an everyday level. Something that everyone here, it doesn't matter your background, whether you have coding or not, you could probably get started quite easily, right? And so I'll start with some devices, and IoT devices specifically. How many people have heard of Arduino, right? How many people have an Arduino sitting at home gathering dust, right? That was me for a long time, okay? So 
Arduino open source hardware, um, open source platform, right? Originally created in like, I think 2006, don't quote me on that. Um, and originally made kind of for artists, right? Um, and it allows you to sense the environment and control the environment. We call those GPIOs, okay? So general purpose input output pins. So the idea that you can sense the environment, proximity sensor, pressure sensor, you know, alcohol breathalyzer, heartbeat, you know, all those kind of things. Um, you know, think about some of your wrist stuff, accelerometer, et cetera. And the ability to affect the output, meaning maybe there's LEDs, maybe you turn on something, um, you know, anything that you can think that kind of visualizes or controls an output, a servo, which is a motor, right? And so Arduino is one of the number one uh, microcontrollers which allow you to sense what's going on and also put output. And so that right there allows you to create experiences that extend well beyond the browser, right? And so if we look at a couple, how many people have heard of Raspberry Pi, right? How many people know the history of Raspberry Pi? Oh, so here. So Raspberry Pi was originally created in the UK and it was created as a self-contained computer for us, the basic Raspberry Pi costs about 40 bucks, okay? You can plug in the monitor, it's got HDMI, you can plug in a keyboard, a mouse, all that kind of good stuff. It's a self-contained computer, right, for 40 bucks, fundamentally. Do you get a lot of RAM and processing and are you gonna play your latest and greatest games on it? No, okay? But the reason why it was created was because in the UK, they noticed this decline in people going into CompSci. And so they're like, how can we at an earlier age get people more interested in it? And so imagine creating a somewhat disposable computer, right? You give it to your kid or you give it to someone who just started CompSci and you don't care if they go and erase a hard drive five times over, right? You don't care that if they go and mess around and start learning with all the uh, you know, inner workings of it. It's 40 bucks, right? And so in terms of economy, it's quite cheap. And so that's where it started, and that's where it was starting to get produced. But then people started to use it for other things, right? So instead of plugging in their desktop, they connected to it remotely, and they might be using it as a file server at home. They might be using it to, you know, a uh, torrent server. They might be using it a uh, media server. They might be using it just for a MAME cabinet to play their video games or those kind of things. So you saw that this item, originally intended for education, all of a sudden used in a whole different aspect. And that's when technology gets interesting. When it's used for its intended purpose, meh. When it's all of a sudden pivots and it's used for an unintended purpose, that's when you start to see some really interesting things happen. So Pi Zero is now a $5 computer, okay? Raspberry Pi, they make no money off of this. Zero money off of this, right? And it's a $5 computer, basically, for, um, it's got everything that you could possibly imagine. It's very, very tiny and allows you to write any kind of programs pretty much that you want, right? You're limited, of course, but imagine that. You're no longer tied to a desktop. You're no longer tied to your monitor. You're no longer tied to a laptop that you're walking around or a tablet that you put up on the wall. You now have something that's tiny that you can fit in the back of your pocket if you want, that you could create an experience and shove it into the back of the wall where you can start to do all these other things because of the form factor alone, right? A couple other devices along the same lines. Anyone heard of the particle photon? Yeah, I'm gonna nerd out on hardware a little bit, but it gives you an idea of what's available. Particle photon, 20 bucks, Wi-Fi enabled, okay? Uh, you program it like an Arduino, it is totally tiny. It's like, you know, I don't know. I don't know what that is, but it's like that. <laughs> I'm trying to think of a measurement, but I can't, so it's like that. It's very, very tiny, very easy to use, and again, almost disposable, right? And so you can start to think about, okay, so maybe you own something, an acreage, where you have to monitor all the water across all the different places. It will only cost you 100 bucks to set something up that you can monitor, and some software skills, right? Not a lot. Most of this stuff is almost plug and play at this point. 
right? So you start to see the reality of the power of the data that you can get for the cost. It's no longer churning and the form factors are smaller. The TESOL is made just for JavaScript people and it's solely runs JavaScript. That's the only language you can program on it and it has little things that you can add into it. It's got a very, very good development community. And again, you're starting to see that there's not one option here because I said Arduino, most people put up their hands. There's multiple options. And based on your price point, based on your knowledge, all that kind of stuff, you have it there for you. There's also the Esperino for again, open source, another option for you. Intel Edison, who knew that Intel was making like microcontrollers and microprocessors, right? Like I always think of Intel as like the commercials, like the chips in the computer, you know? And all of a sudden the Edison is actually that little piece right there. This is what we call breakout board, but it's that little piece there. And again, it's super tiny. And that is now the new kind of form factor. And so Intel had a couple of um, things they've brought to market. Uh, one was Galileo, now the next one was the Edison. So you're starting to see companies across the board are starting to kind of jump in on here. Teensy, again, the Teensy is like an Arduino, totally tiny, not Wi-Fi enabled. So you can tell when you get into this landscape, you need to figure out what your project actually needs to have. How many people have heard of the Mayo bracelet? These are devices that you didn't know you wanted and probably like shouldn't have, right? Myo bracelet, it's like this weird form factor. It's really chunky. You put it on and it will tell you all of your sensory kind of motion data, right? And so it's very easy to program something like a, a Android app, for example, where if you're trying to figure out your golf swing, you can kind of figure out like what is the good movement and you can record it and send it to something else, for example. So you can easily connect these devices um, across the board. Mayo is something that you see at a lot of hackathons, right? Um, and you see a lot of people making really interesting interfaces and interactivity um, and using the Mayo as an input for it. Leap motion, how many people heard of leap motion, right? Leap motion, it tracks your hands. Um, and it gives you really amazing fidelity on your hands. You'd be amazed how hard gesture uh, recognition is, right? How many people here have like, a, like an Xbox One or anything that does like gesture stuff? It's always like, I'm over here, now I'm here, you know, like it's a very hard technology to perfect, right? And when you see something like the leap, it gives you the fidelities, you can figure out all the fingers. Uh, like what motions they are, if you're a closed fist, if you're, you know, doing some kind of, you know, if you're going to do sign language symboling, things like that, you can figure out with a lot of fidelity on the leap motion, and it's a tiny little device, and they've kind of made it easy to connect, right? So you're starting to see these experiences where people are not using the mouse for input anymore. They're not using the keyboard for input anymore. They're using the body for input, right, or gestures for input. Talk about VR a little bit, right? Um, VR is one of those things where uh, a couple years ago, we probably would have said what, right? And now you can't escape it, right? It's everywhere. And v people are talking about VR in terms of storytelling. So they're talking about it a lot in terms of narrative. How do we make uh, VR movies? How do we make interactive experiences in that sense uh, that tell more of a story and more of a narrative? You're talking about VR in terms of games. So game, just straight up augmenting a game and having a VR experience to it. You're also talking about VR in actually very practical applications. How can I put something on and maybe, um, especially VR and AR, augmented reality versus virtual reality, or can I do training through it? Um, if I'm using augmented reality, can I look at a car and can it label the parts and kind of overlay stuff on it so I understand where things are? So it's more of an educational kind of purpose, right? And so when you look at VR a little bit, I like this one because this is how I felt the first time I used it. <laughs> has, anyone, has anyone put on a headset, right? Okay, so first of all, like you don't kind of want to put on a public headset because you're like, ooh, gross, right? This is too close to like all of your facial parts that I don't want to be near, right? So like first thing, when you get the headset, wipe it, you wipe it out. Okay, I'm giving you a little tip, because it's just gross. Um, 
but the other thing is when you put it on, think about VR, um, kind of like the VR experience. Like, you're enclosed. You can't see what's around you, right? And that's where we are currently. That's not where we're going, right? And if you take a look around VR, you will see that. So right now, yes, you've got that chunky headset. And again, they all have different form factors, but they all kind of fundamentally look the same. Big chunky set, I'm alone, right? Like you don't know who's around you. Um, and you're kind of isolated in that way. And those headsets are just about viewing, by the way. Okay? They're just about viewing. They're, that's all they are. When you think about sensory experiences, sensory experiences are not about necessarily what you see. They're also about what you hear, right? They're about that placement of where you are within that experience. So this one, for example, this was like a crazy, crazy experiment that was done. I have to look up the name. I have it listed in my slides. And they created custom VR headsets where it has spatial sound, right? And what they did what these children are actually experiencing right now is that they are seeing the forest as creatures of the forest would see it. So what they did is they took all these data points and tried to visualize what the forest would look like um, and scanned in all these 3D items. And so they're actually looking around as if they might be a rat, as if they might be a snake, and they're seeing this perspective, and they're getting the sounds, and they're getting um, that whole experience. Um, you know, based on, you know, what's being provided in the data. So all of a sudden, when you think about VR, you're no longer thinking about that game or that roller coaster where it's going to make you sick, right? Has anyone tried that, by the way, the roller coaster? It makes you sick. Don't do it. Just, just, or just pass, right? But you're starting to see that they're creating these immersive experiences where it makes sense, right? And where the context is there and where they're taking in more than one uh, kind of element. It's not just about VR. It's not just about the data. It's about merging that together in a very meaningful experience. You're starting to see when it comes to VR, people are thinking about VR, not solely VR. They're thinking about augmenting VR, right? And so VR now becomes uh, a one way to view or one way to experience and it's augmented by other things. Good example is going to be Google's Tilt Brush. Has anyone seen the, the experiments around it? Yeah, so you put on your VR set, you've got, uh, you've got another you know, device that allows you to draw, right? It is an amazing experience if you ever get to use it. It really, really is one of the most captivating uses of the technology that I've personally have experienced in a while. I think it's really fascinating. Um, is it practical? I don't know, but not everything has to be 100% useful, right? And so they actually went and recorded they partnered with like five, uh, I think five artists, maybe six, and they recorded what these artists actually drew, right? And how it actually worked. And so this is something they had just released. And here you see someone from Disney, for example, using it. And all of a sudden you can see it opening up in a little bit of perspective, right? But again, VR as it stands right now, when you think about the VR experience, you need some space around you. How many of you, how many of you live in New York? Yeah, there's no space. There's no space around you, right? So you need the ability to have some space around you because you are going to be using your body and moving around a little bit. It's natural because you don't know how to kind of center yourself within that experience. And so you are going to be using a little bit of that kind of space and you're figuring out like that moment where you're guarded and, and kind of grounded and then you operate within about a foot of that, right? And so you start to see that the spaces that support VR are also going to change. Um, I'm showing you typical headsets. If you're interested in VR, Google Cardboard's 20 bucks. You can do Oculus Rift and now requires a super duper computer, right? Their new version has got some very high, high kind of um, expectations for what it needs to run. Um, there's so many devices out on, the, out on the kind of ballpark out for you there. And you'll see, you know, uh, the Vive, et cetera. And a lot of them, they're getting cheaper and they're being produced quicker and the form factor's changing a little bit. Um, coming from Microsoft, we have the HoloLens, right? Um, something I can't talk too much about. But again, you see the technology changing. 
because instead of a headset like this, you can see your world, you can experience your world, and now something's augmenting your world, and you have 3D sensory sound with it. So you can see, just if you watch the trends of what's going on, how it's being used, you can start to see the patterns, and you can start to watch that VR right now, whether or not I want to admit it, is at its, it's going to explode. I mean, it already has, technically, but the devices are going to be coming and coming and coming. And people are starting to learn how to use it. I mean, yeah, you go, guy. You know, we have now a spec in the browser for web VR, right? So now there's actually a spec, there's an API that you can use, so you don't need to be running a custom app. You can be doing all the work in the browser. And a lot of agencies are doing this. They're instead of they're going to, instead of learning something like Unity or another program, they're going to the web. Everyone knows the web. Why not use the web? And they're leveraging those items. And so you're starting to see frameworks come about for all of this stuff. Visor is one. Um, allowing you now, because we have WebGL, we can process that kind of 3D experience, you're starting to see these other frameworks, right? And then we have A-Frame. A-Frame is very popular as well. And so you have these frameworks that do a lot of the basics. When you talk about frameworks, they're always doing the base level stuff for you so you can get up and running quicker. And so they do a lot of those things for you and very easy to use. And again, now you have this VR experience in the browser. And so it, you can start to see, when you see these trends coming and you start to see these mish, uh, mishmash where you don't expect them, that's where things start to get really interesting because it's gonna propel it even further quicker. I mean, there's way more people doing web dev than there is in Unity, for example, right? So it's the ability to push those technologies might happen a little bit quicker. Don't quote me on that, but you know, it's a theory. When you talk about you know, devices in general, um, and you're talking about microcontrollers, um, you're talking about those little items that can kind of sense the environment, there's a bunch of frameworks, and I'm just gonna list them quickly for you in case anyone here is, wants to take this stuff back. But these frameworks allow you to work with any of those devices very, very, very quickly. Um, they get up and running, and you don't have anything to worry about. So Cylon JS, very easy to use. You basically specify what kind of board you're using. Am I using an Arduino? Am I using a Raspberry Pi? Am I using whatever? And it connects them. Uh, same with Johnny 5. Johnny 5 is one of the most popular ones. Um, again, you can get up and running with it. Node Red is more of a visual node editor. And you're starting to see this a little bit. You're starting to see that intersection between you're not a coder, um, you know, hardcore coder, designer, but designers, you know, they're capable of meeting in the middle, same with developers, right? And so it's that idea of like, you know, are there other ways to expose or work with um, common kind of code uh, blocks, for example, and something more along like a node-based kind of interface like this is something you might start to see. And I'll show another example of it. You also have Device.js. Again, all these frameworks, the JavaScript community, they love to solve problems, right? Um, so many libraries, don't know where to start, but you have all these for you to get started. When we think about these items, we think about connecting them. And one of the hardest things to do when you're building an experience like this is, you know, it's very easy when you're just building a website to know if someone clicked on a button, right? You know, it's, it's an event or however you want to handle it. When you're building experiences where data's coming from one place and going to another and you're connecting devices, whether it's you're building a, something at home that opens your garage door that you can open with, uh, you know, you texting it, for example, or, you know, whatever it may be, the hardest part of this is putting them together, right? Uh, it's not getting this to work and getting that to work, it's getting them to communicate. And sometimes getting them to communicate securely, right? So there's a lot of toolkits out there that kind of take that hard work a little bit out of the process. And so when you're communicating with these items, sometimes you're doing it over Bluetooth, often you're doing it over Wi-Fi. Um, you know, there's other protocols, open sound control. Uh, you know, again, it all depends on how you're working. Um, you know, something like Space Brew. Has anyone heard of Space Brew? I love sharing this. This is actually made by a guy in New York, uh, Brett Refner, and Space Brew was made to connect items, connected experiences, right? 
So it's the idea that you might have an RFID card reader here that needs to go and communicate to something that's shown on a screen. How do you do that, right? And so Space Brew actually allows you to take items and kind of a node-based thing and you connect them. And so it's one of those things to get up and running. Uh, you know, you're building something that's, you know, figuring out your proximity and then opening the door for you. Boom, Space Brew takes a lot of that work out of it for you. Influxus um, is a company that's known for streaming. They just basically said, hey, we'll stream video, right? Because everyone wants to see what's happening. So imagine you're building like a dog treat uh, dispenser and that you can like click on your, I don't know, on an iPhone app. You know, I'm going to dispense a dog treat and you're not at home. Well, and you want to see what happens. Like, what is your dog doing? Is your dog sleeping or is your dog going to go get the treat, right? So you're like, oh, I want to see what's going on. And Fluxus has a platform which handles all the IoT stuff so you can easily trigger something that can trigger something somewhere else and it does all the video streaming for you, right? So now it's like an all-in-one package and it's very easy and quick to get up and running. So these platforms are coming out like bang, 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 bang. Like you can't keep up, right, when it comes to data and when it comes to IoT platforms right now. Um, you also have uh, another one that's, you know, you're basically looking at like open source IoT data platform. Again, they're handling the idea of multiple items communicating to each other and how do they communicate to each other, what protocol do they use, right? So I walked you through some devices. I walked you through a little bit of VR and other devices that you might use, right? Yawn, right? Like, uh. Let's, let's look at like some random fun stuff that maybe will make you think just a little bit differently about your day-to-day, -day, right? Because I think that's the most important is your day-to-day. -day. So experimental will find its application. Um, this is one where basically I decided if I could get into SkyMall, I'd be very stoked. Everyone remember SkyMall, the magazine that solves problems you didn't know you had? So, I went through SkyMall and I went through some inspiration for it and I realized it has everything for anything you might need and I thought a little bit about cats and someone called me a cat lady, I don't have cats um, so I don't, I think that's important in being a cat lady but I'm not sure. <laughs> so I was thinking about this like I'm at home, you know, hanging out with my cats and you know once you have one you have many and if you leave home you know your cats kind of pissed off and you accidentally didn't log out and the next thing you know it's posting images on Facebook, <laughs> right? And then, you know, eating like an animal out of the fruit bowl because it doesn't think you're around. And, you know, if you kind of fall, this is the view you see and they're just like, are you dead yet? Can I eat your face? Right? And so I started to look up like little figurines of cats. They're really creepy online. I did this for you. Do not follow what I did. It is a horrible, horrible black hole on the internet. And you start to see these figurines and I thought what if I could replace my everyday mouse with a cat like physical mouse in my computer and so my buddy and I got this little cat it's made out of uh, rabbit fur which is creepy and we hold it out and we put two LEDs in the eyes and some conductive thread which will allow you to know if someone's touched it right it'll send a signal so you can figure out if something's touched it and <coughs> You know, we figured out, like, you can scroll a web page full of cat photos, right? Again, completely useless, but I now know how to, con you know, talk to a web page, right? And I, I can build something that's totally over here and doesn't make any sense. Um, yeah, my job loved that one. But in the back end, the way they connected was through Space Brew, and this is what Space Brew kind of looks like, where it's like you're saying, okay, I want to accept some information from this processing sketch and I want to send some information from this cat thing over here through JavaScript and you just connect them, right? Um, another one that we built that was really simple and I just, I built a game and then I was like, meh, maybe I should make uh, my own kind of DDR pad. Um, so I built this little game for my niece and it has like, you know, it's like a memory game and the owls go up and they hoot or whatever. Um, that's about the, that's about as far as my design skills go, by the way. Um, and then I found this material called Velostat. It looks like a garbage bag, right? Uh, it costs four bucks at Adafruit. 
So I basically made a little prototype and I have these LEDs running and so the game will play the sequence and then it will light them up and I will have to play them here. And I started to prototype my own DDR pad, um, mostly because I want to figure out how do things connect. So I have a game built in Unity now talking to something that's running on a little microprocessor. Right? And you know, here's me like, this is apparently how I DDR, by the way, one foot. But you know, it's like a simple prototype that we built in the UK while we're on a conference. Um, this is one that we built uh, at Big Spaceship and it's called Booty Bump. And it's that moment where you did something so awesome you don't believe it actually worked. Um, for a developer, it's like 50 lines of code and you're like, oh my god, this worked, right? And you're like, there's no way this worked. Um, and so what we wanted to do is build something that would celebrate that. And so uh, work was like, yeah, I'll give you a little space to work in. So I, I basically got something a little bit bigger than a closet. and. We used a Raspberry Pi and we connected two sensors, pressure sensors, and they're you know little squares, they weren't that big. Um, and we made a little prototype. Everything I do always starts with a prototype that's useless and doesn't make any sense. And this is my friend Dave, who... We did it! You know, if he bumps it, Homer holding two donuts, the two pressure sensors recognize that, and it's playing major laser, and it's turning on and off lights. Right? So those are lights that you would plug into your wall, and I'm controlling them, right? So I'm running relays to them, I'm controlling them, I'm dealing with massive electricity, I you know, managed to retain my eyebrows in this process with Dave, and you know, these two little things, and then this became, I thought, oh, maybe, I, has anyone seen Cupcake Wars? I'm probably the only person. They do this thing where they're like, we're gonna make sculptures, and they take like wire and foam it. So I was like, I'm gonna just like form myself. This will be awesome. Like, I don't look like this. It's, you know, that's what I ended up looking like. But we installed it in the shop, and so every time if you went and bumped it, it would play eight, se you know, eight seconds of music um, off and on, and you know, you could have your little eight seconds of joy, of celebration. Uh, it lasted probably about three hours in the shop. It was like, First of all, the joy that people, when you see someone using something as ridiculous as it is, the joy is not something you can ever get from building a web page, right? So it's a different kind of experience. And also, it just was so completely disruptive. They're like, please take it down. <laughs> um, this is another one where uh, my nephew was really into dubstep and he was telling me about uh, Skrillex. And this is what I thought of dubstep. Wah, wah, wah. And I thought, well, Skrillex kind of looks like that. I just need that. And then I might have had a couple bourbons on a Friday night, and I was on Amazon, and I found a T Rex, and T Rexes are awesome. So I screwed up uh, my whole Amazon recommendation history buying this. <laughs> and what I did is I put a little sensor in it that's just a bendy sensor. And I thought, what if I could drop bass, right, with Skrill, uh, Skrill T Rex? and I could dynamically create something. So I said, well, how do you create dubstep? And he's like, oh, Ableton. And I was like, oh, Ableton has MIDI. It's like a protocol that allows you to communicate. And that's why a lot of uh, DJs, they have their own little soundboards that they build and things like that. And I was like, yeah. Work was also like, why? <laughs> right? And then work was like, can you do something productive? And so <laughs> I was like, OK, I'll learn how to laser cut. And I made this little heart, and it's kind of like a Zelda heart. And the idea was, I'll go to the Twitter streaming API. I'll see who follows me and follows me, you know, all that kind of jazz, which I actually really don't pay attention to. I'm the worst Twitter person ever. And you know, I started to lay down some NeoPixels, and I did the wiring. I also did the gluing. It's ugly. I take full uh, responsibility for that. And this item now reads a Twitter API and runs custom a uh, animations based on what happens. So if you like something, it'll beat. If you unfollow me, it'll totally just drain out a couple times. And now I have this device that sits up on a wall, runs off a little power charger that you might use for your phone, and it's now an analog item showing me what's happening in the digital world. Um, I'll go very, very quick because I'm out of time. Uh, w a couple other things that we built. I got work to actually buy into this. They are like, oh, OK, it's not boring. Let's try it. And so I convinced this guy, let's create something that dispenses shots uh, every time someone says a buzzword. So like, let's take a keynote and figure out and dispense shots, right? 
because you're always like, take a drink, take a drink, like as a joke or whatever. Um, and so we took this container, and again, everything's a simple prototype. Took this container, you know, most people use it for lemonade. Uh, we did not. Um, we added what's called a solenoid, which will open and close. And then we added what's called relay, which allows you to basically open and close that item at will. Um, and then we wrote uh, an application that will analyze sound and it'll look for certain buzzwords. Um, and based on those buzzwords, it would open it up and dispense just a shot. And it, was, it would play the music every time, shot, shot, shots. And I showed this to my GM. Uh, we like we like hierarchy at Microsoft, and so you can imagine like three bosses up is looking at me like, are you kidding me? And I was like, yeah, this is what I built today. What do you think? You know. Um, so when it comes to these kind of things, <laughs> it's about finding some of the shortcuts for yourself that's going to help you, and it's also about solving those problems that you didn't think you necessarily had or weren't quite sure how to go about it. Sometimes you just have an idea and you don't get to the end solution the way you thought, right? <laughs> but this stuff is coming up very, very quick. Things are changing all the time. It's hard to keep up. But I think it's really important that even if you don't know a lot, just to kind of dive in. And so, you know, you don't want it to kind of just sneak up on you and suddenly you're like complacent, <laughs> right? So I'm going to leave it at that. If you have any questions, come find me. Thank you.